Brazilian Ants and Monkeys by Henry W. Bates. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Naturalist in the Amazons of Henry Walter Bates is a work that has long held a deserved reputation for the closeness and accuracy of its observations and the interest of its narrative. The author, born at Leicester, England, in 1825, accompanied the noted biologist, Alfred Russell Wallace, to Brazil, the story of which journey is given in the work cited. From it we extract some passages concerning the animal life of that country, embracing the doings of the leaf-cutting ants and the monkeys. Our selections begin in the suburbs of Pará. In the gardens, numbers of fine showy butterflies were seen. There were two swallow-tailed species, similar in colors to the English Papilio macaon, a white pyris, P. monuste, and two or three species of brimstone and orange-colored butterflies, which do not belong, however, to the same genus as our English species. In weedy places, a beautiful butterfly with eye-like spots on its wings was common, the Junonia lavinia, the only Amazonian species which is at all nearly related to our Vanessas, the admiral and the peacock butterflies. One day we made our first acquaintance with two of the most beautiful productions of nature in this department, namely the Helicopis cupido and Endymion. A little beyond our house, one of the narrow green lanes which I have already mentioned, diverged from the Mongabu Avenue, and led between enclosures overrun with a profusion of creepy plants and glorious flowers down to a moist hollow where there was a public well and a picturesque nook buried in a grove of mukaja palm trees on the tree trunks walls and palings grew a great quantity of climbing pothos plants with large glossy heart-shaped leaves these plants were the resort of these two exquisite species and we captured a great number of specimens. They are of extremely delicate texture. The wings are cream-colored. The hind pair have several tail-like appendages, and are spangled beneath as if with silver. Their flight is very slow and feeble. They seek the protected under surface of the leaves, and in repose close their wings over the back, so as to expose the brilliantly spotted under surface. I will pass over the many orders and families of insects, and proceed at once to the ants. These were in great numbers everywhere, but I will mention here only two kinds. We were amazed at seeing ants an inch and a quarter in length, and stout in proportion, marching in single file through the thickets. These belong to the species called Dinoponera grandis, its colonies consist of a small number of individuals, and are established about the roots of slender trees. It is a stinging species, but the sting is not so severe as in many of the smaller kinds. There was nothing peculiar or attractive in the habits of this giant among the ants. Another far more interesting species was the sauba, Oikodoma cephalotis, this ant is seen everywhere about the suburbs, marching to and fro in broad columns. From its habit of despoiling the most valuable cultivated trees of their foliage, it is a great scourge to the Brazilians. In some districts, it is so abundant that agriculture is almost impossible, and everywhere complaints are heard of the terrible pest. In our first walks, we were puzzled to account for large mounds of earth, of a different color from the surrounding soil, which were thrown up in the plantations and woods. Some of them were very extensive, being forty yards in circumference, but not more than two feet in height. We soon ascertained that these were the work of the saubas, being the outworks or domes which overlie and protect the entrances to their vast subterranean galleries. On close examination, I found the earth of which they are composed to consist of very minute granules, agglomerated with cement, and forming many rows of little ridges and turrets. 
the difference in color from the superficial soil of the vicinity is owing to their being formed of the undersoil brought up from a considerable depth it is very rarely that the ants are seen at work on these mounds the entrances seem to be generally closed only now and then when some particular work is going on are the galleries opened the entrances are small and numerous in the larger hillocks it would require a great amount of excavation to get at the main galleries but i succeeded in removing portions of the dome in smaller hillocks and then i found that the minor entrances converged at a depth of about two feet to one broad elaborately worked gallery or mine which was four or five inches in diameter the habit in the saúba ant of clipping and carrying away immense quantities of leaves has long been recorded in books on natural history when employed on this work their processions look like a multitude of animated leaves on the march in some places i found an accumulation of such leaves all circular pieces about the size of a sixpence lying on the pathway unattended by ants and at some distance from the colony such heaps are always found to be removed when the place is revisited the next day in course of time i had plenty of opportunities of seeing them at work they mount the trees in multitudes the individuals being all worker miners each one places itself on the surface of a leaf and cuts with its sharp scissor-like jaws and by a sharp jerk detaches the piece sometimes they let the leaf drop to the ground where a little heap accumulates until carried away by another relay of workers but generally each marches off with the piece it has operated upon and as all take the same road to their colony the path they follow becomes in a short time smooth and bare looking like the impression of a cart wheel through the herbage it is a most interesting sight to see the vast host of busy diminutive laborers occupied on this work unfortunately they choose cultivated trees for their purpose this ant is quite peculiar to tropical america as is the entire genus to which it belongs it sometimes despoils the young trees of species growing wild in its native forests but it seems to prefer when within reach plants imported from other countries such as the coffee and orange trees the heavily laden workers each carrying its segment of leaf vertically the lower edge secured in its mandibles troop up and cast their burdens on the hillock another relay of laborers place the leaves in position covering them with a layer of earthy granules which are brought one by one from the soil beneath the underground abodes of this wonderful ant are known to be very extensive the rev hamlet clark has related that the saúba of rio de janeiro a species closely allied to ours has excavated a tunnel under the bed of the river paraíba at a place where it is as broad as the thames at london bridge at the maguari rice mills near pará these ants once pierced the embankment of a large reservoir the great body of water which it contained escaped before the damage could be repaired in the botanic gardens at pará an enterprising french gardener tried all he could think of to extirpate the saúba with this object he made fires over some of the main entrances to their colonies and blew the fumes of sulphur down the galleries by means of bellows i saw the smoke issue from a great number of outlets one of which was seventy yards distant from the place where the bellows were used this shows how extensively the underground galleries are ramified besides injuring and destroying young trees by despoiling them of their foliage the saúba ant is troublesome to the inhabitants from its habit of plundering the stores of provisions in houses at night for it is even more active at night than in the daytime at first i was inclined to discredit the stories of their entering habitations and carrying off grain by grain the farinha or mandioca meal the bread of the poorer classes of brazil at length while residing at an indian village on the tapajós 
I had ample proof of the fact. One night, my servant woke me three or four times before sunrise by calling out that the rats were robbing the farinha baskets. The article at that time was scarce and dear. I got up, listened, and found the noise very unlike that made by rats. So I took the light and went into the storeroom, which was close to my sleeping place. I there found a broad column of saúba ants, consisting of thousands of individuals, as busy as possible, passing to and fro between the door and my precious baskets. Most of those passing outward were laden, each with a grain of farinha, which was, in some cases, larger and many times heavier than the bodies of the carriers. Farinha consists of grains of similar size and appearance to the tapioca of our shops. Both are products of the same root, tapioca being the pure starch, and farinha the starch mixed with woody fiber, the latter ingredient giving it a yellowish color. It was amusing to see some of the dwarfs, the smallest members of their family, staggering along, completely hidden under their load. The baskets, which were on a high table, were entirely covered with ants, many hundreds of whom were employed in snipping the dry leaves which served as lining. This produced the rustling sound which had at first disturbed us. My servant told me that they would carry off the whole contents of the two baskets, about two bushels, in the course of the night if they were not driven off, so we tried to exterminate them by killing them with our wooden clogs. It was impossible, however, to prevent fresh hosts coming in as fast as we killed their companions. They returned the next night, and I was then obliged to lay trains of gunpowder along their line and blow them up. This, repeated many times, at last seemed to intimidate them, for we were free from their visits during the remainder of my residence at the place. What they did with the hard dry grains of mangioca I was never able to ascertain and cannot even conjecture. The meal contains no gluten, and therefore would be useless as cement." It contains only a small relative portion of starch, and when mixed with water, it separates and falls away like so much earthy matter. It may serve as food for the subterranean workers, but the young or larvae of ants are usually fed by juices secreted by the worker nurses. Leaving the ants with this example of their curious habits, we shall proceed with the author's description of Brazilian monkeys. I have already mentioned that monkeys were rare in the immediate vicinity of Pará. I met with three species only, in the forest near the city. They are shy animals, and avoid the neighborhood of towns, where they are subject to much persecution by the inhabitants, who kill them for food. The only kind which I saw frequently was the little Midas Ursulus, one of the marmosets, a family peculiar to tropical America, and differing in many essential points of structure and habits from all other apes. They are small in size, and more like squirrels than true monkeys in their manner of climbing. The nails, except those of the hind thumbs, are long and claw-shaped, like those of squirrels, and the thumbs of the four extremities, or hands, are not opposable to the other fingers. I do not mean to convey that they have a near relationship to squirrels, which belong to the rodents, an inferior order of mammals. Their resemblance to those animals is merely a superficial one. They have two molar teeth less in each jaw than the Cebidae, the other family of American monkeys. They agree with them, however, in the sideway position of the nostrils, a character which distinguishes both from all the monkeys of the old world. The body is long and slender, clothed with soft hairs, and the tail which is nearly twice the length of the trunk, is not prehensile. The hind limbs are much larger in volume than the anterior pair. The Midas Ursulus is never seen in large flocks. Three or four is the greatest number observed together. It seems to be less afraid of the neighborhood of men than any other monkey. I sometimes saw it in the woods which border the suburban streets, and once I espied two individuals in a thicket behind the English consul's house at Nazareth. Its mode of progression along the main boughs of the lofty trees is like that of squirrels. It does not ascend to the slender branches or take those wonderful flying leaps which the Sibidae do, whose prehensile tails and flexible hands 
fit them for such headlong travelling. It confines itself to the larger boughs and trunks of trees, the long nails being of great assistance to the creature, enabling it to cling securely to the bark, and it is often seen passing rapidly round the perpendicular cylindrical trunks. It is a quick, restless, timid little creature, and has a great share of curiosity for when a person passes by under the trees along which a flock is running, they always stop for a few moments to have a stare at the intruder. In Pará, Midas Ursulus is often seen in a tame state in the houses of the inhabitants. When full-grown, it is about nine inches long, independently of the tail, which measures fifteen inches. The fur is thick and black in color, with the exception of a reddish-brown streak down the middle of the back. When first taken, or when kept tied up, it is very timid and irritable. It will not allow itself to be approached, but keeps retreating backward when any one attempts to coax it. It is always in a querulous humor, uttering a twittering, complaining noise. Its dark, watchful eyes, expressive of distrust, observant of every movement which takes place near it. When treated kindly, however, as it generally is in the houses of the natives, it becomes very tame and familiar. I once saw one as playful as a kitten running about the house after the negro children, who fondled it to their heart's content. It acted somewhat differently towards strangers, and seemed not to like them to sit in the hammock which was slung in the room, leaping up, trying to bite, and otherwise annoying them. It is generally fed on sweet fruits, such as the banana, but it is also fond of insects, especially soft-bodied spiders and grasshoppers, which it will snap up with eagerness when within reach. The expression of countenance in these small monkeys is intelligent and pleasing. This is partly owing to the open facial angle, which is given as one of sixty degrees, but the quick movements of the head and the way they have of inclining it to one side when their curiosity is excited, contribute very much to give them a knowing expression. Anatomists who have dissected species of Midas tell us that the brain is of a very low type, as far as the absence of convolutions goes, the surface being as smooth as that of a squirrel's. I should conclude at once that this character is an unsafe guide in judging of the mental qualities of these animals, in mobility of expression of countenance, intelligence and general manners these small monkeys resemble the higher apes far more than they do any rodent animal with which i am acquainted on the upper amazon i once saw a tame individual of the midas leoninus a species first described by humboldt which was still more playful and intelligent than the one just described this rare and beautiful little monkey is only seven inches in length exclusive of the tail. It is named Leoninus on account of the long brown mane which depends from the neck, and which gives it very much the appearance of a diminutive lion. In the house where it was kept, it was familiar with everyone. Its greatest pleasure seemed to be to climb about the bodies of different persons who entered. The first time I went in, it ran across the room, straightway to the chair on which I sat down, and climbed up to my shoulder, Arrived there, it turned round and looked into my face, showing its little teeth and chattering, as though it would say, Well, and how do you do? It showed more affection towards its master than towards strangers, and would climb up to his head a dozen times in the course of an hour, making a great show every time of searching there for certain animalcula. Isidore Geoffrey St. Hilaire relates of a species of this genus that it distinguished between different objects depicted on an engraving. M. Audouin showed it the portraits of a cat and a wasp. At these it became much terrified, whereas at the sight of a figure of a grasshopper or beetle it precipitated itself on the picture as if to seize the objects they represented. Although monkeys are now rare in a wild state near Pará, a great number may be seen semi-domesticated in the city. The Brazilians are fond of pet animals. Monkeys, however, have not been known to breed in captivity in this country. I counted in a short time thirteen different species while walking about the Pará streets, 
either at the doors or windows of houses, or in the native canoes. Two of them I did not meet with afterwards, in any other part of the country. One of these was the well-known Hapali Yakis, a little creature resembling a kitten, banded with black and grey all over the body and tail, and having a fringe of long white hair surrounding the ears. It was seated on the shoulder of a young mulatto girl, as she was walking along the street, and I was told had been captured in the island of Marajó. The other was a species of Cebus, with a remarkably large head. It had ruddy brown fur, paler on the face, but presenting a blackish tuft on the top of the forehead. The only monkeys I observed at Cametá were the Cochillo, Pathesia satanus, a large species, clothed with long brownish-black hair, and the tiny Midas argentatus. The Cochillo had a thick, bushy tail. The hair of the head sits on it like a cap, and looks as if it had been carefully combed. It inhabits only the most retired parts of the forest, on the terra firma, and I observed nothing of its habits. The little Midas argentatus is one of the rarest of the American monkeys. I have not heard of its being found anywhere except near Cametá. I once saw three individuals together running along a branch in a cacao grove near Cametá. They looked like white kittens. In their motions they resembled precisely the Midas ursulus already described. I saw afterwards a pet animal of this species, and heard that there were many so kept, and that they were esteemed as choice treasures. The one I saw was full-grown, but it measured only seven inches in length of body. It was covered with long, white, silky hairs, the tail was blackish, and the face nearly naked and flesh-colored. It was a most timid and sensitive little thing. The woman who owned it carried it constantly in her bosom, and no money would induce her to part with her pet. She called it Miko. It fed from her mouth and allowed her to fondle it freely, but the nervous little creature would not permit strangers to touch it. If any one attempted to do so, it shrank back, the whole body trembling with fear, and its teeth chattered, while it uttered its tremulous frightened tones. The expression of its features was like that of its more robust brother, Midas Ursulus. The eyes, which were black, were full of curiosity and mistrust, and it always kept them fixed on the person who attempted to advance towards it. In the orange groves and other parts hummingbirds were plentiful, but I did not notice more than three species. I saw a little pygmy belonging to the genus Phthornis one day, in the act of washing itself in a brook. It was perched on a thin branch, whose end was under water. It dipped itself, then fluttered its wings and pruned its feathers, and seemed thoroughly to enjoy itself alone in the shady nook which it had chosen, a place overshadowed by broad leaves of ferns and heliconi. I thought, as I watched it, that there was no need for poets to invent elves and gnomes, while nature furnishes us with such marvellous little sprites ready to hand. End of Brazilian Ants and Monkeys by Henry W. Bates The Broken Window from the book Essays on Political Economy by the late M. Frederick Bastiat, published in 1874, in the section of the book entitled that which is seen and that which is not seen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the broken window have you ever witnessed the anger of the good shopkeeper james b when his careless son happened to break a pane of glass if you have been present at such a scene you will most assuredly bear witness to the fact that every one of the spectators were there even thirty of them by common consent apparently offered the unfortunate owner this invariable consolation it is an ill wind that blows nobody good everybody must live and what would become of the glaziers if panes of glass were never broken 
now this form of condolence contains an entire theory which it will be well to show up in this simple case seeing that it is precisely the same as that which unhappily regulates the greater part of our economical institutions suppose it costs six francs to repair the damage and you say that the accident brings six francs to the glazier's trade that it encourages that trade to the amount of six francs i grant it i have not a word to say against it you reason justly the glazier comes performs his task receives his six francs rubs his hands and in his heart blesses the careless child all this is that which is seen but if on the other hand you come to the conclusion as is too often the case that it is a good thing to break windows that it causes money to circulate and that the encouragement of industry in general will be the result of it you will oblige me to call out stop there your theory is confined to that which is seen it takes no account of that which is not seen it is not seen that as our shopkeeper has spent six francs upon one thing he cannot spend them on another it is not seen that if he had not had a window to replace he would perhaps have replaced his old shoes or added another book to his library in short he would have employed his six francs in some way which this accident has prevented let us take a view of industry in general as affected by this circumstance the window being broken the glazier's trade is encouraged to the amount of six francs this is that which is seen if the window had not been broken the shoemaker's trade or some other would have been encouraged to the amount of six francs this is that which is not seen and if that which is not seen is taken into consideration because it is a negative fact as well as that which is seen because it is a positive fact it will be understood that neither industry in general nor the sum total of national labor is affected whether windows are broken or not now let us consider james b himself in the former supposition that of the window being broken he spends six francs and has neither more nor less than he had before the enjoyment of a window in the second were we to suppose the window not to have been broken he would have spent six francs in shoes and would have had at the same time the enjoyment of a pair of shoes and of a window now as james b forms a part of society we must come to the conclusion that taking it all together and making an estimate of its enjoyments and its labors it has lost the value of the broken window whence we arrive at this unexpected conclusion society loses the value of things which are uselessly destroyed and we must ascend to a maxim which will make the hair of protectionists stand on end to break to spoil to waste is not to encourage national labor or more briefly destruction is not profit what will you say moniteur industrial what will you say disciples of good m f shamans who has circulated with so much precision how much trade would gain by the burning of paris from the number of houses it would be necessary to rebuild i am sorry to disturb these ingenious calculations as far as their spirit has been introduced into our legislation but i beg him to begin them again by taking into account that which is not seen and placing it alongside of that which is seen the reader must take care to remember that there are not two persons only but three concerned in the little scene which i have submitted to his attention one of them james b represents the consumer reduced by an act of destruction to one enjoyment instead of two another under the title of the glazier shows us the producer whose trade is encouraged by the accident the third is the shoemaker or some other tradesman whose labor suffers proportionably by the same cause it is this third person who is always kept in the shade and who personating that which is not seen is a necessary element of the problem it is he who shows us how absurd it is to think we see a profit in an act of destruction it is he who will soon teach us that it is not less absurd to see a profit in a restriction which is after all nothing else than a partial destruction therefore if you will only go to the root of all the arguments which are adduced in its favor 
all you will find will be the paraphrase of this vulgar saying what would become of the glaziers if nobody ever broke windows end of the broken window by frederick bastiat recording by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana in september 2018The Contrite Consciousness from Phenomenology of the Spirit by Georg Wilhelm Hegel, published in 1807, translated by Josiah Royce. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Contrite Consciousness In skepticism, consciousness learns in truth that it is divided against itself. And from this experience there is born a new type of consciousness, wherein are linked the two thoughts which skepticism had kept asunder. The thoughtless self-ignorance of skepticism must pass away. For, in fact, the two attitudes of skepticism express one consciousness. This new type of consciousness is therefore explicitly aware of its own doubleness. It regards itself, on the one hand, as the deliverer, changeless and self-possessed. On the other hand, it regards itself as the absolutely confounded and contrary, and it is the awareness of this its own contradiction. In Stoicism, the self owns itself in the simplicity of freedom. In skepticism, it gives itself embodiment, makes not of other embodied reality, but in the very act of so doing, renders itself the rather twofold, and is now parted in twain. Hereby, the same duplication that was formerly shared between two individuals, the lord and the slave, has now entered into the nature of one individual the differentiation of the self which is the essential law of the spirit is already present but not as constituting an organic unity and the contrite consciousness is this awareness of the self as the divided nature wherein is only conflict this contrite and broken consciousness just because the conflict of its nature is known as belonging to one person must forever in each of its two forms have the other also present to it whenever in either form it seems to have come to victory and unity it finds no rest there but is forthwith driven over to the other its true homecoming its true reconciliation with itself will however display to us the law of the spirit as he will appear when having come to life he has entered the world of his manifestation for it already belongs to the contrite consciousness to be one undivided soul in the midst of its doubleness it is in fact the very gazing of one self into another it is both these selves it has no nature save in so far as it unites the two but thus far it knows not yet this its own real essence it has not entered into possession of this unity for the first then the contrite consciousness is but the unone unity of the two selves to its view the two are not one but are at war together and accordingly it regards one of them viz the simple the changeless consciousness as the true self the other the multiform and fickle it regards as the false self the contrite consciousness finds these two as mutually estranged for its own part because it is the awareness of this contradiction it takes sides with the changeless consciousness and calls itself the false self but since it is aware of the changeless i e of the true self its task must be one of self-deliverance that is the task of delivering itself from the unreality for on the one hand it knows itself only as the fickle and the changeless is far remote from it 
and yet the contrite consciousness is in its genuine selfhood one with the simple and changeless consciousness for therein lies its own true self and yet again it knows that it is not in possession of this true self so long as the contrite consciousness assigns to the two selves this position they cannot remain indifferent to each other or in other words the contrite consciousness cannot itself be indifferent to the changeless for the contrite consciousness is as a fact of both kinds and knows the relation of the changeless to the fickle as a relation of truth to falsehood the falsehood must be turned to naught but since the contrite consciousness finds both the false and the true alike necessary to it and contradictory there remains to it only the contradictory movement wherein neither of the opposed elements can find repose in going over to its opponent but must create itself anew in the opponent's very bosom to win then in this strife against the adversary is rather to be vanquished to attain one goal is rather to lose it in its opposite the whole life whatever it be whatever it do is aware only of the pain of this being and doing for this consciousness has no object besides its opposite the true self and its own nothingness in aspiration it strives hence toward the changeless but this aspiration is itself the contrite consciousness and contains forthwith the knowledge of the opposite namely of its own individuality the changeless when it enters consciousness is sicklied or with individuality is present therewith instead of being lost in the consciousness of the changeless individuality rises ever afresh therein but one thing the contrite consciousness thus learns namely that individuality is made manifest in the changeless and that the changeless is made manifest in individuality it finds that in general individuality belongs to the changeless true self and that in fact its own individuality also belongs thereto for the outcome of this process is precisely the unity of this twofold consciousness this unity then comes to light but for the first only as an unity wherein the diversity of the two aspects plays the chief part for the contrite consciousness there thus result three ways in which individuality and the changeless are linked first it rediscovers itself as again banished into its opposition to the changeless self and it is cast back to the beginning of the strife which later still remains the element of the entire relationship in the second place the contrite consciousness learns that individuality belongs to the very essence of the changeless is the incarnation of the changeless and the latter hereupon assumes the burden of its whole range of phenomena in the third place the contrite consciousness discovers itself to be the individual who dwells in the changeless in the first stage the changeless appears to consciousness only as the remote self that condemns individuality in passing through the second stage consciousness learns that the changeless is as much an incarnate individual as it is itself and thus in the third stage consciousness reaches the grade of the spirit rejoices to find itself in the spirit and becomes aware that its individuality is reconciled with the universal what is here set forth as the character and relationship of the changeless has appeared as the experience that the divided consciousness obtains in its woe this experience is to be sure not its own one-sided process for it is itself the changeless consciousness and the latter is also an individual consciousness so that the process is all the while a process in the changeless consciousness belonging to the latter quite as much as to the other for the changeless consciousness passes through the three stages 
being first the changeless as in general opposed to the individual then becoming an individual over against another individual and finally being united with the latter but this observation in so far as it is made from our own point of view as observers is here premature for thus far we have come to know the changeless only in so far as consciousness has defined it not as yet the true changeless but the changeless as modified by the duality of consciousness has come to our sight and so we know not how the developed and self-possessed changeless will behave what has resulted from the foregoing is only this that the mentioned characteristics appear to the consciousness now under consideration as belonging to the changeless consequently the changeless consciousness itself also preserves even in its incarnate form the character and principle of separation and isolation as against the individual consciousness from the latter's point of view the fact that the changeless takes on the form of individuality appears as something which somehow comes to pass the opposition to the changeless is something moreover which the individual consciously merely finds as a fact the relation seems to it merely a result of its natural constitution as for the final reconciliation the individual consciousness looks upon this as a part of its own deed the result of its own individuality but it also regards a part of the unity as due both in origin and in existence to the changeless the element of opposition thus remains even in the unity in fact in taking on the incarnate form the changeless has not only retained but actually confirmed its character of remoteness for although in assuming a developed and incarnate individuality it seems on the one hand to have approached the individual still on the other hand it now stands over against him as an opaque fact of sense with all the stubbornness of the actual about it the hope that the individual may become one with the changeless must remain but hope empty and distant for between hope and fruition stand now the fatal chance and the lifeless indifference which has resulted from that very incarnation wherein lies the foundation of the hope because the changeless has thus entered the world of facts has taken on the garments of actuality it follows necessarily that in the world of time it has vanished that in space it is far away and forever far remains if at the outset the mere notion of the divided consciousness demanded that it should undertake the destruction of its individuality and the growth into the changeless the present result defines the undertaking thus that the individual should leave off its relation with the formless ideal and should come only into relation with the changeless as incarnate for it is now the fact of the unity of the individual and the changeless which has become the truth and the object for consciousness as before in the mere notion only the abstract and disembodied changeless was the essential object and consciousness now finds the total separation of the notion as the relation which is to be forgotten the thing which has now to be reduced to unity is the still external relation to the embodied ideal in so far as the latter is a foreign actuality the process whereby the unreal self seeks to reach this unity is once more threefold since it will be found to have a threefold relation to its incarnate but remote ideal in the first place it will appear as the devout consciousness in the second place as an individual whose relation to the actuality will be one of aspiration and of service in the third place it will reach the consciousness of self-possession we must now follow these three stages of being and see how they are involved in the general relation and are determined thereby 
taking the first state that of the devout consciousness one finds indeed that the incarnate changeless as it appears to this consciousness seems to be present in all the completeness of its being but as a fact the fashion of the completed being of the changeless has not yet been developed should this completed being be revealed to consciousness the revelation would be as it were rather the deed of the ideal than the work of the devout consciousness and thus the revelation would come from one side only would be no full and genuine revelation but would remain burdened with incompleteness and with duality although the contrite consciousness still lacks the presence of its ideal it is nevertheless as we see also beyond the stage of pure thought whether such thought were the mere abstract thinking of stoicism which forgets all individuality or the merely restless thinking of scepticism which in fact embodies individuality in its ignorant contradictions and its ceaseless unrepose both of these stages the contrite consciousness has transcended it begins the synthesis of pure thought and of individuality and persists therein but it has not yet risen to the thought which is aware of the reconciliation of the conscious individual with the demands of pure thought contrite consciousness stands between the two extremes at the place where pure thought and the individual consciousness meet it is in fact itself this meeting place it is the unity of pure thought and individuality it even knows that pure thought yes the changeless itself is essentially individual but what it does not know is that this its object the changeless which it regards as having necessarily assumed an incarnate individuality is identical with its own self with the very individual as he is in consciousness its attitude then in this first form in which it appears as the devout consciousness is not one in which it explicitly thinks about its object it is implicitly indeed the consciousness of a thinking individual and its object also is a thinking individual but the relation between these two is still one that defies pure thought consciousness accordingly as it were makes but a feint at thinking and takes the form of adoration such thought as it has remains the mere formless tinkling of an altar bell or the wreathing of warm incense smoke a thinking in music such as never reaches an organized notion wherein alone an inner objectivity could be attained this limitless and devout inner feeling finds indeed its object but as something uncomprehended and so as a stranger thus come to pass the inward activity of the devout soul which is indeed self-conscious but only in so far as it possesses the mere feeling of its sorrowful disharmony this activity is one of ceaseless longing it possesses the assurance that its true self is just such a pure soul pure thought in fact taking on the form of individuality and that this being who is the object of the devotion since he possesses the thought of his own individuality recognizes and approves the worshipper but at the same time this being is the unapproachable and remote as you seize hold upon him he escapes or rather he has already gone away he has already gone away for he is the ideal giving himself in thought the form of an individual and therefore consciousness gets without hindrance its self-fulfillment in him gets self-fulfillment but only to learn that it is the opposite of his ideal instead of seizing hold on the true self its mere feeling is all it sinks back into itself unable at the moment of union to escape finding itself at the very opposite of the ideal it has actually seized hold upon its own untruthfulness not upon truth in the true self it has sought to find its own fulfillment 
but its own means only as isolated individual reality for the same reason it cannot get hold upon the true self in so far as he is at once an individual and a reality where one seeks him the true self is not to be found for by definition he is the remote self and so is to be found nowhere to seek him in so far as he is an individual is not to look for his universal his ideal individuality nor for his presence as the law of life but merely to seek him as an individual fact as a fact among facts as something that sense could touch unhindered but as such an object the ideal exists only as a lost object what consciousness finds is thus only the sepulchre of its true life but this sepulchre is now the actuality and moreover one that by its nature forbids any abiding possession the presence of this tomb means only the strife of a search that must be fruitless but consciousness thus learns there is no real sepulchre which can contain its true lord the changeless as lord who has been taken away he is not the true lord the changeless will no longer be looked for here below or grasped after as the vanished one for hereby consciousness learns to look for individuality as a genuine and universal ideal in the next place then the return of the soul to itself is to be defined as its knowledge that in its own individuality it has genuine being it is the pure heart which potentially or from our point of view has discovered the secret of self-satisfaction for although in feeling it is sundered from its ideal still this feeling is in essence a feeling of self-possession what has been felt is the ideal as expressed in terms of pure feeling and this ideal is its own very self it issues from the process then as the feeling of self-possession and so as an actual and independent being by this return to itself it has from our point of view passed to its second relationship that of aspiration and service and in this second stage consciousness confirms itself in the assurance of self-possession an assurance which we now see it to have attained by overcoming and feeding upon the true self which in so far as it was an independent thing was estranged from the point of view of the contrite consciousness however all that yet appears is the aspiration and the service it knows not yet that in finding these it has the assurance of self-possession as the basis of its existence and that its feeling of the true self is a self-possessed feeling not knowing this it has still ever within it the fragmentary assurance of itself therefore any confirmation which it should receive from toiling and from communion would still be a fragmentary confirmation yes itself it must destroy even this confirmation also finding therein indeed a confirmation of something but only of its isolation and its separation the actual world wherein the aspiration and the service find their calling seems to this consciousness no longer an essentially vain world that is only to be destroyed and consumed but rather like the consciousness itself a world broken in twain which is only in one aspect vain while in another aspect it is a sanctified world wherein the changeless is incarnate for the changeless has retained the nature of individuality and being as changeless and universal its individuality has in general the significance of all actuality if consciousness were now aware of its independent personality and if it regarded the actual world as essentially vain it would get the feeling of its independence in its service and in its communion since it would be aware of itself as the victory that overcometh the world 
but because the world is regarded by it as an embodiment of the ideal it may not overcome by its own power it does indeed attain to conquest over the world and to a feasting thereon but to this end it is essential that the changeless should itself give its own body as the food and in this respect consciousness appears as a mere matter of fact having no part in the deed but it also appears as inwardly broken in twain and this doubleness its division into a self that stands in a genuine relation to itself and to reality and a self whose life is hidden and undeveloped is now apparent in the contrast between its service and its communion as in actual relation to the world consciousness is a doer of works and knows itself as such and this side belongs to the individuality but it has also its undeveloped reality this is hidden in the true self and consists in the talents and virtues of the individual they are a foreign gift the changeless grants them to consciousness that they may be used in doing its good works consciousness is for the first parted into a relationship between two extremes on the one side stands the toiler in the world here below on the other side stands the passive actuality in whose midst he toils both are related to each other both however are also referred to the changeless as their source and have their being hidden therein from each side then there is but a shadowy image let free to enter into play with the other that the term of the relationship which is called the actuality is overcome by the other term the doer of good works but the former term for its part can only be overcome because its own changeless nature overcomes it divides itself in twain and gives over the divided part to be the material for deeds the power that does the deeds appears as the might that overcometh the world but for this very reason the present consciousness which regards its true self as something foreign must regard this might also whereby it works as a thing remote from itself instead of winning self-possession from its good works and becoming thereby sure of itself consciousness relates all this activity back again to the other member of the relationship which thus proves itself to be the pure universal the absolute might whence flows every form of activity and wherein lies the truth both of the mutually dissolving terms as they first appeared and of their interchanging of relationship the changeless consciousness sacrifices its body and gives it over to be used on the other hand the individual consciousness renders thanks for the gift forbids itself the satisfaction of a sense of independence and refers all its doings to the changeless in these two aspects of the mutual sacrifice made by both the members of the relation consciousness does indeed win the sense of its own oneness with the changeless but at the same time this oneness is still beladen with the separation and is divided in itself the opposition between the individual and the universal comes afresh to sight for consciousness only seems to resign selfish satisfaction as in fact it gets selfish satisfaction for it still remains longing activity and fulfillment as consciousness it has longed it has acted it has been filled in giving thanks in acknowledging the other as the true self in making naught of itself it has still been doing its own deed this deed has repaid the deed of the other has rendered a price for the kindly sacrifice if the other has offered its own image as a gift consciousness for its part has made its return in thanks and has herein done actually more than the other since it has offered its all namely its good works while the other has but parted with its mere image 
the entire process returns then back to the side of the individual and does so not merely in respect to the actual aspiration service and communion but even in respect to the very act of giving thanks an act that was to attain the opposite result in giving thanks consciousness is aware of itself as this individual and refuses to be deceived by its own seeming resignation what has resulted is only the twofold reference of the process to its two terms and the result is the renewed division into the conflicting consciousness of the changeless on the one hand and on the other hand the consciousness of the opposed will activity and fulfilment and even of the very resignation itself for these constitute in general the separated individuality herein begins the third phase of the process of this consciousness which follows from the second as a consciousness that in truth by will and by deed has proved its independence in the first phase it was the mere notion of a live consciousness an inner life that had not yet attained actuality by service and communion the second phase was the attainment as outer activity and communion returned from this outer activity consciousness has now reached the stage where it has experienced its own actuality and power where it knows in truth that it is fully self-possessed but now the enemy comes to light in his most genuine form in the struggle of the inner life the individual has existence only as an abstraction as passed in music out of sight in service and in communion as the realization of this unreal selfhood it is able in its immediate experience to forget itself and its consciousness of its own merit in this actual service is turned to humiliation through the act of thankful acknowledgment but this humiliation is in truth a return of consciousness to itself and to itself as the possessor of its own actuality this third relationship wherein this genuine actuality is to be one term is that relationship of the actuality to the universal wherein the actuality is nevertheless to appear as an unreality and the process of this relationship is still to be considered in the first place as regards the conflicting relationship of consciousness wherein its own reality appears to it as an obvious nothingness the result is that its actual work seems to it a doing of naught and its satisfaction is but a sense of its misery work and satisfaction thus lose all universal content and meaning for if they had any then they would involve a full self-possession both of them sink to the level of individuality and consciousness turning upon this individuality devotes itself to making naught of it consciousness as an actual individual is a consciousness of the mere animal functions of the body these latter are no longer naively carried out as something that is altogether of no moment and that can have no weight or significance for the spirit on the contrary they become the object of earnest concern and are of the most weightiest moment the enemy arises anew in his defeat consciousness holds him in eye yet frees itself not from him but rather dwells upon the sight and sees constantly its own uncleanness and because at the same time this object of its striving instead of being significant is of the most contemptible instead of being an universal is of the most individual we therefore behold at this stage only a brooding unhappy and miserable personality limited solely to himself and his little deeds but all the while this person links both to the sense of his misery and to the worthlessness of his deeds the consciousness that he is one with the ideal 
for the attempted direct destruction of individuality is determined by the thought of the ideal and takes place for the sake of the ideal this relation of dependence constitutes the essence of the negative onslaught upon individuality but the dependence is as such potentially positive and will bring consciousness to a sense of its own unity this determinant dependence is the rational tie whereby the individual who at first holds fast by his opposition to the true self is still linked to the other term yet only by means of a third element this mediating element reveals the true self to the false self which in its turn knows that in the eyes of the true self it has existence only by virtue of the dependence it is the dependence then which reveals the two terms of the relationship to one another and which as mediator takes the part of each one of the terms in presence of the other the mediator too is a conscious being for its work is the production of this consciousness as such what it brings to pass is that overcoming of individuality which consciousness is undertaking through the mediator then consciousness frees itself from regarding its good works and its communion as due to its private merit it rejects all claims to independence of will it casts upon the mediator the intercessor the burden of its self-will its freedom of choice and its sins the mediator dwelling in the immediate presence of the ideal gives counsel as to what is to be done and what is done being in submission to the will of another is no longer one's own act what is still left to the untrue self is the objective result of the deed the fruit of the toil the satisfaction but this too it refuses to accept as its own and resigns not only its self-will but the actual outcome of its service and its satisfaction it resigns this outcome first because the latter would involve an attainment of self-conscious truth and independence and this consciousness lives in the thought and the speech of a strange and incomprehensible mystery secondly moreover it resigns the outcome in so far as the latter consists of worldly goods and so it abandons in a measure whatever it has earned by its labor thirdly it resigns all the satisfaction which has fallen to its lot forbidding itself such satisfaction through fasting and through penance by these characteristics by the surrender of self-will of property and of satisfaction and by the further and positive characteristic of its undertaking of a mysterious task consciousness does in truth free itself completely from any sense of inner or outer freedom from any trust in the reality of its independence it is sure that it has verily surrendered its ego and has reduced its natural self-consciousness to a mere thing to a fact among facts only by such a genuine self-surrender could consciousness prove its own resignation for only thus does there vanish the deceit that lies in the inner offering of thanks with the heart with the sentiments and with the lips such offering does indeed strip from the individual all independent might and ascribes all the glory to the heavenly giver but the individual even when thus stripped retains his outer self-will for he abandons not his possessions and he retains his inner self-will for he is aware that it is he who undertakes this self-sacrifice and who has in himself the virtue involved in such an undertaking a virtue which he has not exchanged for the mysterious grace that comes from above but in the genuine resignation when once it has come to pass consciousness in laying aside the burden of its own deeds has also in effect laid aside the burden of its grief yet that this laying aside has already in effect taken place 
is due to the deed of the other member of the tie namely to the essential self the sacrifice of the unreal self was made not by its own one-sided act but involved the working of the other's grace for the resignation of self-will is only in part negative and on the other hand involves in its very notion or in its beginning the positive transformation of the will and in particular its transformation from an individual into an universal will consciousness finds this positive meaning in the denial of self-will to consist in the will of the changeless as this will is done not by consciousness itself but through the counsel of the mediator consciousness becomes aware then that its will is universal and essential but it does not regard itself as identical with this essential nature self-resignation is not seen to be in its very notion identical with the positive work of the universal will in the same way the abandonment of possession and of satisfaction has only the same negative significance and the universal that thus comes in sight does not appear to consciousness as its own deed the unity of truth and of self-possession implied in the notion of this activity an unity which consciousness accordingly regards as its essence and its reality is not recognized as implied in this very notion nor is the unity recognized by consciousness as its own self-created and immediately possessed object rather does consciousness only hear spoken by the mediator's voice the still fragile assurance that its own grief is in the yet hidden truth of the matter the very reverse namely the bliss of an activity which rejoices in its task that its own miserable deeds are in the same hidden truth the perfect work and the real meaning of this assurance is that only what is done by an individual is or can be brackets uberhaupt in brackets a deed but for consciousness both activity and its own actual deeds remain miserable its satisfaction is its sorrow and the freedom from this sorrow in a positive joy it looks for in another world but this other world where its activity and its being are to become even while they remain its own real activity and being what is this world but the image of reason of the assurance of consciousness that in its individuality it is and possesses all reality end of the contrite consciousness from phenomenology of the spirit by georg wilhelm hegel published in eighteen hundred and seven freely translated from the german by josiah royce Dislikes by Oliver Wendell Holmes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Dislikes by Oliver Wendell Holmes. I want it to be understood that I consider that a certain number of persons are at liberty to dislike me preemptorily without showing cause and that they give no offence whatever in doing so if i did not cheerfully acquiesce to this sentiment toward myself on the part of others i should not feel at liberty to indulge my own aversions i try to cultivate a christian feeling to all my fellow creatures but inasmuch as i must also respect truth and honesty i confess to myself a certain number of inalienable dislikes and prejudices some of which may possibly be shared by others some of these are purely instinctive for others i can assign a reason our likes and dislikes play so important a part in the order of things that it is well to see on what they are founded 
there are persons i meet occasionally who are too intelligent by half for my liking they know my thoughts beforehand and tell me what i was going to say of course they are masters of all my knowledge and a good deal besides have read all the books i have read and in later editions have had all the experiences i have been through and more too in my private opinion every mother's son of them will lie at any time rather than confess ignorance i have a kind of dread rather than hatred of persons with a great excess of vitality great feeders great laughers great storytellers who come sweeping over their company with a huge tidal wave of animal spirits and boisterous merriment i have pretty good spirits myself and enjoy a little mild pleasantry but i am oppressed and extinguished by these great lusty noisy creatures and feel as if i were a mute at a funeral when they get into full blast i cannot get along much better with those drooping languid people whose vitality falls short as much as that of others is in excess i have not life enough for two i wish i had it is not very enlivening to meet a fellow creature whose expression and accent say you are the hair that breaks the camel's back of my endurance you are the last drop that makes my cup of woe run over persons whose heads drop on one side like those of toothless infants whose voices recall the tones in which our old snuffling choir used to wail out the verse of life is the time to serve the lord there is another style that does not captivate me i recognize an attempt at a grand manner now and then in persons who are well enough in their own way but of no particular importance socially or otherwise some family tradition of wealth or distinction is apt to be at the bottom of it and it survives all the advantages that used to set it off i like family pride as well as my neighbors and respect the high-born fellow citizen whose progenitors have not worked in their shirt sleeves for the last two generations full as much as i ought to but the grand pere oblige a person with a known grandfather is too distinguished to find it necessary to put on airs the few royal princes i have happened to know were very easy people to get along with and had not half the social knee action i have often seen in the collapsed dowagers who lifted their eyebrows at me in my earlier years my heart does not warm as it should do toward the persons not intimates who are always too glad to see me when we meet by accident and discover all at once that they have a vast deal to unbosom themselves of to me there is one blameless person whom i cannot love and have no excuse for hating it is the innocent fellow creature otherwise inoffensive to me whom i find i have involuntarily joined on turning a corner i suppose the mississippi which is flowing quietly along minding its own business hates the missouri for coming into it all at once with its muddy stream i suppose the missouri in like manner hates the mississippi for diluting its limpid but insipid current with rich reminiscences of the varied soils through which its own stream has wandered i will not compare myself to the clear or the turbid current but i will own that my heart sinks when i find all of a sudden i am in for a corner confluence and i cease loving my neighbor as myself until i can get away from him the end of dislikes by oliver wendell home An everyday experience from moonbeams from the larger lunacy by Stephen Leacock this is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. An Everyday Experience by Stephen Leacock. He came across to me in the semi silence room of the club. I had a rather queer hand at bridge last night, he said. Had you? I answered, and picked up a newspaper. Yes, it would have interested you, I think, he went on. Would it? I said, and moved to another chair. It was like this, he continued, following me. I held the king of hearts. Half a minute, I said. I want to go and see what time it is. I went out and looked at the clock in the hall. I came back. And the queen, and the tan, he was saying. Excuse me, just a second. I want to ring for a messenger. I did so. The waiter came and went. And the nine and two small ones, he went on. Two small what? I asked. Two small hearts, he said. I don't remember which. Anyway, I remember very well indeed that I had the king and the queen and the jack, the nine and two little ones. When I came back to him, it was still murmuring. My partner held the ace of clubs and the queen. The jack was out, but I didn't know where the king was. You didn't, I said in contempt. No, he repeated in surprise and went on murmuring. Diamonds had gone round once and spades twice, so I suspected that my partner was leading from weakness. I can well believe it, I said. Sheer weakness. Well, he said, on the sixth round the lead came to me. Now, what should I have done? Finesse for the ace, or led straight to my opponent? You want my advice, I said, and you shall have it, openly and fairly. In such a case as you describe, where a man has led out at me repeatedly, and with provocation, as I gather from what you said, though I myself do not play bridge, I would lead my whole hand at him. I repeat, I do not play bridge, but in the circumstances I would think it the only thing to do. The End of An Everyday Experience by Stephen Leacock In Defense of an Offering by Sewell Ford From the Wit and Humor of America Edited by Marshall P. Wilder Volume 7 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman In Defense of an Offering by Sewell Ford Gracious, you're not going to smoke again. I do believe, my dear, that you are getting to be a regular etc., etc., voice from across the reading table. A slave to tobacco? Not I. Singular, the way you women misuse nouns. I am, rather, a chosen accolade in the temple of Nicotiana. Daily? I thrice daily. Well, call it six, then. Do I make burnt offering? Now some use censers of clay, others employ censers of rare white earth, finely carved, and decked with silver and gold. My particular censer, as you see, is a plain honest briar, a root dug from the banks of the blue Garona, whose only glory is its grain and color. The original tint, if you remember, was like that of new-cut cedar, but use I have been smoking this one only two years now, has given it a gloss and depth of tone which put the finest mahogany to shame. Let me rub it on my sleeve. Now look. There are no elaborate mummeries about our service in the temple of Nicotiana. No priest or pastor, no robed musian or gowned prelate calls me to the altar. Neither is there a fixed hour or prescribed point of the compass toward which I must turn. Whenever the mood comes and the spirit listeneth, I make devotion. 
There are various methods, numerous brief litanies. Mine is a common and a simple one. I take a cut Indian leaf in the left palm, so, and roll it gently around with the right, thus. Next I pack it firmly in the censer's hollow bowl, with neither too firm nor too light a pressure. Any fire will do. The torch need not be blessed. Thanks, I have a match. Now we are ready. With the surplus breath of life you draw in the fragrant spirit of the weed. With slow, reluctant outbreathing, you loose it on the quiet air. Behold, that which was but a dead thing lives. Perhaps we have released the soul of some brave red warrior who, long years ago, fell in glorious battle and mingled his dust with the unforgiving earth. Every puff may give everlasting liberty to some dead and gone aboriginal. If you listen, you may hear his far-off chant. Through the curling blue wreaths you may catch a glimpse of the happy hunting ground to which he has now gone. That is the part of the service whose losing and gaining depends upon yourself. The first whiff is the invocation, the last the benediction. When you knock out the ashes, you should feel conscious that you have done a good deed, that the offering has not been made in vain. Slave? Still that odious word. Well, have it your own way. Worshippers at every shrine have thus been persecuted. The End of In Defense of an Offering by Sewell Ford Letter of Edward Stilling Fleet to Elizabeth Countess Dowager of Jocelyn by Edward Stilling Fleet, 1635-1699 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. To the Right Honorable Elizabeth, Countess Dowager of Jocelyn, Late Earl of Northumberland. Madam, among the number of those who congratulate your safe return into our own country wherein your ladyship is so justly beloved and esteemed by all that honour virtue and goodness give me leave to express my duty in an address more agreeable to my own profession than some perhaps will think it is to your quality and condition those i mean who measure their greatness by their contempt of religion and all that belong to it who know nothing of wit or virtue beyond the stage or think the leviathan contains in it the whole duty of man the utmost these persons will allow us whose honour and employment lies in asserting the truth of religion and persuading to the practice of it is that we are men of profession and speak of the things we are to live by as though reason and religion were such contemptible wares as scarce any would inquire after it if it were not some men's trade to put them off and were of less force in themselves because it is our duty and interest to maintain them is it any disparagement to a prince to have subjects obliged to defend his honour and servants to attend his person and must not what they say or do be at all minded because their own interest is joined with his why then should religion suffer in the esteem of any because she hath servants of her own to defend her cause as if it had always been a received principle with mankind that no man is to be trusted in his own profession according to this the lawyers ought to preach and the divines plead causes because the one gets nothing by divinity nor the other by law the merchant should visit patients and the physicians attend the committees of trade because it is dangerous trusting men in what they are most concerned to understand 
when once i see persons forbear to consult the lawyers about settling their estates and physicians for their health merely because they get by their professions i shall then think it is something else besides a pick at religion which makes them so ready to condemn whatever is said by us in behalf of it because forsooth it is our trade to defend it i wish it were theirs as much to practise it and then we should not be troubled with removing these and such prejudices against all the discourses of religion which are spoken and published by us but of these matters which we conceive to be of so high concernment to mankind we desire nothing may be considered besides the force of reason and weight of argument and surely none that own themselves to be men will despise that by whomsoever it is brought it is not every ridiculous story or vulgar prejudice or common infirmities or different opinions in smaller things which ought to render religion ridiculous or make the practice of it be thought mean and contemptible but however they are resolved to think of us let not religion suffer for our sakes indeed if they did as truly love religion as they despise us we might then have reason to suspect ourselves but when we suffer merely upon her account we have cause to rejoice in our dishonour and ought to suspect ourselves if such persons did speak well of us madam the main design of these following discourses is to recommend the great matters of religion from their truth and certainty their power and advocacy the benefit and advantage which comes by them and to dissuade from the practice of sin from the folly and reproach the present dissatisfaction and future punishment which attends it if they may be of use to the world and any ways serviceable to your ladyship in your retirements i have the end i aimed at and i have therefore presumed to dedicate them to your ladyship not only because of the great obligations which i have to yourself and family which were first laid upon me by that excellent person the late lord treasurer your father but likewise because you have so well followed so worthy an example in joining greatness and goodness together were it my design to publish your just and due character i should not need to find fault with the age to give the greater advantage to your virtue all the harm i wish the age is that there were many more persons of your condition that did as little need and as much despise the meanness of flattery i am madam your ladyship's most obliged and humble servant edward stillingfleet end of letter of edward stillingfleet to elizabeth countess dowager of jocelyn by edward stillingfleet sixteen thirty five to sixteen ninety nine mary white by william allen white this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org mary white one seems to know her after reading this sketch written by her father on the day she was buried would surely have laughed unbelievingly if told she would be in a book of this sort together with joseph conrad one of whose books lay on her table. But the pen in the honest hand has always been mightier than the grave. This is not the sort of thing one wishes to mar with clumsy comment. It was written for the Emporia Gazette, which William Allen White has edited since 1895. He is one of the best-known, most public-spirited, and most truly loved of American journalists. He and his fellow Kansan, E. W. Howe of Atchison, are two characteristic figures in our newspaper world, both masters of that vein of canny, straightforward, humane, and humorous simplicity that seems to be a Kansas birthright. Mr. White was born in Emporia in 1868. The Associated Press reports carrying the news of Mary White's death declared that it came as the result of a fall from a horse. How she would have hooted at that! 
she never fell from a horse in her life. Horses have fallen on her and with her. I'm always trying to hold them in my lap, she used to say. But she was proud of few things, and one was that she could ride anything that had four legs and hair. Her death resulted not from a fall, but from a blow on the head which fractured her skull, and the blow came from the limb of an overhanging tree on the parking. The last hour of her life was typical of its happiness. She came home from a day's work at school, topped off by a hard grind with the copy on the high school annual, and felt that a ride would refresh her. She climbed into her khakis, chattering to her mother about the work she was doing, and hurried to get her horse and be out on the dirt roads for the country air and the radiant green fields of the spring. As she rode through the town on an easy gallop, she kept waving at passers-by. She knew everyone in town. For a decade, the little figure with the long pigtail and the red hair ribbon has been familiar on the streets of Emporia, and she got in the way of speaking to those who nodded at her. She passed the curs, walking the horse in front of the normal library, and waved at them, passed another friend a few hundred feet further on and waved at her. The horse was walking, and as she turned into North Merchant Street, she took off her cowboy hat, and the horse swung into a lope. She passed the triplets and waved her cowboy hat at them, still moving gaily north on Merchant Street. A gazette carrier passed, a high school boyfriend, and she waved at him, but with her bridal hand. The horse veered quickly, plunged into the parking where the low-hanging limb faced her, and while she still looked back waving, the blow came. But she did not fall from the horse. She slipped off, dazed a bit, staggered, and fell in a faint. She never quite recovered consciousness. But she did not fall from the horse, neither was she riding fast. A year or so ago she used to go like the wind, but that habit was broken and she used the horse to get into the open to get fresh, hard exercise and to work off a certain surplus energy that welled up in her and needed a physical outlet. That need has been in her heart for years. It was back of the impulse that kept the dauntless little brown-clad figure on the streets and country roads of this community and built into a strong, muscular body what had been a frail and sickly frame during the first years of her life. But the riding gave her more than a body, it released a gay and hearty soul. She was the happiest thing in the world. And she was happy because she was enlarging her horizon. She came to know all sorts and conditions of men. Charlie O'Brien, the traffic cop, was one of her best friends. W. L. Holtz, the Latin teacher, was another. Tom O'Connor, farmer politician, and Reverend J. H. J. Rice, preacher and police judge, and Frank Beach, music master, were her special friends and all the girls, black and white, above the track and below the track, in Pepville and Stringtown, were among her acquaintances. And she brought home riotous stories of her adventures. She loved to rollick. Persiflage was her natural expression at home. Her humor was a continual bubble of joy. She seemed to think in hyperbole and metaphor. She was mischievous without malice, as full of faults as an old shoe, no angel was Mary White, but an easy girl to live with, for she never nursed a grouch five minutes in her life. With all her eagerness for the out-of-doors, she loved books. On her table when she left her room were a book by Conrad, one by Galsworthy, Creative Chemistry by E. E. Slauson, and a Kipling book. She read Mark Twain, Dickens, and Kipling before she was ten, all of their writings. Wells and Arnold Bennett particularly amused and diverted her. She was entered as a student in Wellesley in 1922, was assistant editor of the high school annual this year, and in line for election to the editorship of the annual next year. She was a member of the executive committee of the high school YWCA. Within the last two years, she'd begun to be moved by an ambition to draw. She began, as most children do, by scribbling in her school books funny pictures. She bought cartoon magazines and took a course, rather casually, naturally, for she was, after all, a child with no strong purposes. And this year she tasted the first fruits of success by having her pictures accepted by the high school annual. But the thrill of delight she got when Mr. E. Cord of the normal annual asked her to do the cartooning for that book this spring was too beautiful for words. She fell to her work with all her enthusiastic heart. Her drawings were accepted, and her pride 
always repressed by a lively sense of the ridiculousness of the figures she was cutting, was a really gorgeous thing to see. No successful artist ever drank a deeper draft of satisfaction than she took from the little fame her work was getting among her schoolfellows. In her glory she almost forgot her horse, but never her car, for she used the car as a jitney bus. It was her social life. She never had a party in all her nearly seventeen years, wouldn't have one. But she never drove a block in the car in her life that she didn't begin to fill the car with pickups. Everybody rode with Mary White, white and black, old and young, rich and poor, men and women. She liked nothing better than to fill the car full of long-legged high school boys and an occasional girl and parade the town. She never had a date nor went to a dance except once with her brother Bill, and the boy proposition didn't interest her, yet. But young people, great spring-breaking, varnish-cracking, fender-bending, door-sagging carloads of kids, gave her great pleasure. Her zests were keen, but the most fun she ever had in her life was acting as chairman of the committee that got up the big turkey dinner for the poor folks at the county home. Scores of pies, gallons of slaw, jam, cakes, preserves, oranges, and a wilderness of turkey were loaded in the car and taken to the county home. And being of a practical turn of mind, she risked her own Christmas dinner by staying to see that the poor folks actually got it all. Not that she was a cynic, she just disliked to tempt folks. While there she found a blind-colored uncle, very old, who could do nothing but make rag rugs, and she rustled up from her school friends rags enough to keep him busy for a season. The last engagement she tried to make was to take the guests at the county home out for a car ride, and the last endeavor of her life was to try to get a restroom for colored girls in the high school. She found one girl reading in the toilet because there was no better place for a colored girl to loaf, and it inflamed her sense of injustice, and she became a nagging harpy to those who she thought could remedy the evil. The poor she had always with her and was glad of it. She hungered and thirsted for righteousness, and was the most impious creature in the world. She joined the Congregational Church without consulting her parents, not particularly for her soul's good. She never had a thrill of piety in her life, and would have hooted at a testimony. But even as a little child she felt the church was an agency for helping people to more of life's abundance, and she wanted to help. She never wanted help for herself. Clothes meant little to her. It was a fight to get a new rig on her, but eventually a harder fight to get it off. She never wore a jewel and had no ring but her high school class ring, and never asked for anything but a wristwatch. She refused to have her hair up, though she was nearly seventeen. Mother, she protested, you don't know how much I get by with in my braided pigtails that I could not with my hair up. Above every other passion in her life was her passion not to grow up, to be a child. The tomboy in her, which was big, seemed to loathe to be put away forever in skirts. She was a Peter Pan who refused to grow up. Her funeral yesterday at the Congregational Church was as she would have wished it. No singing, no flowers, save the big bunch of red roses from her brother Bill's Harvard classmen. Heavens, how proud that would have made her! And the red roses from the Gazette Force in vases at her head and feet. A short prayer, Paul's beautiful essay on love, from the thirteenth chapter of First Corinthians, some remarks about her democratic spirit by her friend John H. J. Rice, pastor and police judge, which she would have deprecated if she could, a prayer sent down for her by her friend, Carl Now, and opening the service the slow, poignant movement from Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, which she loved, and closing the service, a cutting from the joyously melancholy first movement of Tchaikovsky's Pathetic Symphony, which she liked to hear in certain moods on the phonograph. Then the Lord's Prayer by her friends in the high school. That was all. For her pallbearers, only her friends were chosen. Her Latin teacher, W. L. Holtz, her high school principal, Rice Brown, her doctor, Frank von Cannon, her friend, W. W. Finney, her pal at the Gazette office, Walter Hughes, and her brother, Bill. It would have made her smile to know that her friend Charlie O'Brien, the traffic cop, had been transferred from Sixth and Commercial to the corner near the church to direct her friends who came to bid her goodbye. 
a rift in the clouds in a gray day threw a shaft of sunlight upon her coffin as her nervous energetic little body sank to its last sleep but the soul of her the glowing gorgeous fervent soul of her surely was flaming in eager joy upon some other dawn end of mary white by william allen white A New York Balloon Ascension by Charles F. Durant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A New York Balloon Ascension, being an open letter by Mr. Charles F. Durant, published in the Journal of Commerce and dated May 31st, 1833. Communicated by Mr. Charles Never Holmes of Newton, Massachusetts. The high wind which prevailed at my departure from Castle Garden Wednesday evening prevented me from taking the instruments of which I promised to furnish you notes. The weather was very doubtful in the morning. My barometer had fallen in twelve hours from 29.52 to 29.416, though the day previous I had shifted its position and thought it probable that the alteration might be caused from haste or inattention in setting the nonus before the mercury was perfectly tranquil my doubts increased at eleven o'clock when dr chilton told me his barometer on tuesday six p m stood at thirty point one and wednesday six a m at thirty point four and while conversing with him at eleven a m it had fallen to thirty at one p m mine stood at twenty nine point four dr chilton's remained thirty and mr charles pool's at twenty nine point four yet from the appearance of the atmosphere there was a probability of very little wind though no indication of fine weather and judging from the twenty preceding days i had little cause to anticipate more favourable weather at any definite time to which i might postpone the ascension the gates were thrown open and i commenced the inflation of the balloon at two o'clock between three and four the mist became more dense and the wind increased from the south-south-east with strong indication of rain at this time a large company had collected and the inflation proceeded to the state in which i never will postpone it if i can get the balloon out of the garden at five i finished attaching the car and the balloon two-thirds filled was buoying the whole weight which i intended it to carry it is in this situation that i usually suspend my philosophical instruments and it is likewise in this position that the balloon is in most danger of bursting from the force of the wind curling over the wall a circumstance that occurred at my second ascension and but for great exertions and prompt assistance would have proved fatal to the enterprise fearing the same accident on this occasion i gave myself only time sufficient to move the balloon to the southeast corner of the garden which i had selected for a starting point i then ordered the two cords to be cut which had served to steady the top of the balloon the wind now bore with great force causing a half turn in the net and cords which gave it a tangled appearance and i judged twelve chances per minute of causing a rupture therefore to ensure the ascension i cut the only remaining cord which unmoored the balloon and it rose in beautiful style with an ascensional power of seventy pounds making a north-northwest course though rising with such rapidity as to form an angle of nearly eighty degrees with the earth at ten minutes past five i reached the summit of the clouds which had obscured the sun rays so long from the earth i had been absent now only six minutes and having left my instruments i judged the then attained altitude to be at least one mile here the sun broke forth with all the majesty peculiar to our finest summer days and so suddenly a transition you may well imagine had a thrilling effect one cluster of clouds only remained above me their course i judged by the sun bore northwest and at a very short distance this gave me some uneasiness lest they should be charged with the electric fluid which by the established laws on this science might pass to my balloon in a few seconds however i was far above everything resembling a cloud here burst upon my sight one of the most imposing views i had ever beheld call it majestic 
splendid or sublime invoke a shakespeare's mind to describe or a painter's to portray it they and even thought must fail to conceive the rich downy softness and the white fleecy accumulation of clouds piled in waves as far as the eye could reach covering the earth and closing to my sight the land water and everything animate or inanimate that i had so long and often viewed with delight above me nothing but a clear cerulean expanse the golden sunbeams spreading over the vast ocean of clouds and extending through immensity of space where sight is bounded and from whence even thought returns unable to traverse the confines of the vast field beyond here was a scene sufficient for the writer to fill volumes and the painter to exhaust his skill in trying to delineate the infinitely delicate and mellow tints reaching to boundless extent imagine yourself in my situation with this sublime scene opening to your sight and you can conceive better than i can describe the sensations it would naturally produce i do not wish to convey any frightful ideas respecting the whole view yet you must not suppose it was all pleasure to me or that i was perfectly free from care i assure you gentlemen i felt some unpleasant anxieties from having too much ascensional power the information of those holding the car is the means by which i ascertain its buoyancy and owing to the surging effects of the wind on the balloon they were not able to ascertain the correct power i had resolved to start with a great ascensional force as the only plan to clear the garden with safety i found on swinging clear the balloon had a buoyancy of full forty pounds more than i had intended and my first care was to open the valve to counteract the upward tendency and except a few seconds to pass the dense cloud which appeared in the northwest i never closed the valve till i had been absent thirty-nine minutes from the earth when to my great gratification some scraps of tissue paper remained stationary in the horizontal line with the car these scraps i use as floats to throw in the air by them i can ascertain much sooner than by the barometer when i am rising or falling this first intimation of falling dispelled my anxieties and closing the valve i prepared to descend and leisurely lowered one anchor with two hundred or three hundred feet of cord though the heat increased the first six minutes the cold was now intense my flagstaff is of cedar and touching it to clear the anchor it had an icy coldness at a safe estimate i was now sixteen or seventeen thousand feet from the earth and i do not think the barometer would have given an altitude of nearer five than three miles but as i had left it below this is only an estimate while descending i had little else to do than to rest and refresh myself by rubbing my hands which were somewhat cut by the valve cord and benumbed with the cold i could now contemplate the scene around me and must say i regretted on nearing the earth to pass through the dense fog which had given me no very pleasant feeling on first passing through it and at six hours twenty-three minutes when i had descended to its upper surface hearing the roar of the surf i judged myself on the shore of the atlantic i examined my ballast which i considered rather a scant pattern to remain long suspended over the ocean and while revolving in my mind what i could best dispense with in case of necessity among which were my coat hat and one anchor and cable and even the car from below the first hoop to allow me a place to stand on i heard the cawing of some crows which again revived my spirits and at six thirty nine i heard some forest birds which left me no doubt i was over terra firma in one minute after i saw the earth i was then suspended over some trees and threw over a bag of ballast which broke the fall a little and carried me to a clear field where the anchor struck at six hours and forty one minutes on the farm of r morris esq manor of fordham westchester county new york eleven miles from city hall three from hudson river and eight from long island sound the whole time that i remained in the air was one hour thirty seven minutes one hour and thirteen minutes of which time i had sunshine with a perfectly clear sky four negroes from the farm of mr morris assisted me to fold the balloon which is not injured in the slightest degree i started for the city in a wagon 
and on approaching macomb's dam a heavy rain obliged me to put up at mr de Beau's till morning when he took me to harlem and mr bradshaw sent me to the city where i arrived at castle garden at half past nine o'clock after an absence of sixteen hours enjoying my usual good health and spirits end of a new york balloon ascension by charles f durant read by phil schempf